Happy Thursday. It is September the 22nd, 2016, Thursday. This is Thomas, host of uh, blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel and libertarianprogressive.com where you can see all the interviews we've done. Uh, we'll have 50 plus interviews with candidates who are on the ballots, who are independent third party candidates on the ballots, who are the only independent third party candidates um, the only third option in their district or their race or wherever the area is that they're running. And today we have an interview with Galen Kent, Libertarian, U.S. House, District 3 in Colorado. And uh, so we interview independents, Green Party, Third Party, No Party. And so we're going to give him a call and um, let the audience know what is available out there besides the Republican or Democrats. And that's good to know. This is Galen. Hey, Galen. Uh, good day. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We're on live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And um, happy Thursday. And happy Thursday to you, sir. All right, and you're running as a Libertarian for Congress from Colorado's 3rd District, um, and you're the only third option in that district this year, November 8th, when it comes to November 8th, when people will be uh, choosing who to represent them in the U.S. Congress. Is that right? That is correct. There has been an independent candidate, a young lady who uh, – uh, got signatures and earned her way on the ballot the past couple of years, but uh, chosen not to run this year. So I, there's only three candidates on the ballot, me, the Republican, and the Democrat. Wow. And um, so what made you run this year and, and not be a Democrat or Republican? It seems like that's all there is, And uh, at least right now, at least right now. I have been a libertarian my entire life. <laughs> I grew up in Los Angeles, and I can remember back in the 70s instructing my dad, who was a half-hearted Republican, to vote for Ed Clark, the Libertarian presidential nominee that year. And uh, I have never been anything other than a Libertarian. So there was no... Uh, I never considered running as anything else. All right, awesome. So, I mean, uh, you're a true believer here, and... Um, so, well, let's look at the issues here. What's your platform? Um, what makes you better than the, um, as a choice as representative, than your opponents there? The, uh, I have four reasons I am running this year. Uh, the first reason is I want an America at peace. This nation has been at war since 1989, every day since we invaded Panama. Um, the consequences of that have been as tragic as they've been widespread. We are, American intervention is responsible for most of the violence in our world. And I really believe that the uh, rash of mass shootings that we have had in this country um, can be laid directly at the doorstep of a violent American government. We have people who have never known a peaceful day in their lives. A violent government has created violent citizens. And uh, I think if America were at peace, well, let me ask you this. Let me ask our listeners this. If America had been at peace continuously since 1989, would we have half the violence we do now? I don't think so. ISIS wouldn't exist. 9-11 would not have happened. And mass shootings would be um, very, very rare. Yeah, I think I, I – I mean, that's probably a safe hypothesis to assume. I mean, let's give it a chance, you know, and uh, of course, I mean, we would have a strong military, right, at the same I, uh, time. I, yes, I'm a veteran. I served on an old diesel submarine in the Navy back in the 80s. I fully support the strongest defense America can afford, um, and we're a wealthy nation. We can afford the very best. We do not need to go butting into anybody else's business, though. 
Yeah, sometimes I wonder if there wasn't any oil in the Middle East if we'd be there because there's lots of tragedies all around the world um, as far as human rights goes. But uh, it seems like, you know, we're just picking and choosing the ones that happen to have that black gold, you know, under the uh, crust layers of the earth. Um, so, well, what's besides peace and prosperity, what are your three other issues that you're running on? The uh, second one is uh, prosperity, low taxes and free markets. We are not going to have a uh, truly flourishing economy till it's anchored in low taxes and free markets. Right now it's anchored in high taxes and regulation. And the government likes to cite statistics that say the economy is uh, is flourishing and anybody who has had to hit the streets looking for work, like me, knows it's not true. Um, I earn a living five days a week. I'm a front desk supervisor at uh, a timeshare in Steamboat Springs, and my wife works at Walmart where I pull a couple, three shifts a week. It's a tough. It's tough. It's tough out there. Wages are not great. Benefits are miserly, and it's hard to find. It's hard to make a go of it in this country for working people. So, I support a flat tax of no more than ten percent on individuals. Americans have more money to spend. Uh, businesses would have their tax rate cut as well. Um, perhaps later we can talk about eliminating it because a business owner made a very good argument for that. But Americans have more money to spend. Businesses are paying fewer or no taxes. They have more money to meet our needs. Um, almost by definition, that's a flourishing economy. More Americans will be more working and they'll be making better wages. So that's number two, uh, low taxes and free markets. And I stole that phrase from a book by Steve Forbes. Um, it's a brilliant book. Great, great. Well, yeah, we'll come back to that other points about no taxes for corporations and, and then also ask you a follow-up about small businesses and uh, mid-sized businesses as well. But, yeah, let's hear okay. these four points. Uh, we'll open with that. The third one is I want an America that does not convict the innocent. This is not an issue that's on a lot of people's radar, honestly. It's seldom brought up unless I bring it up. But um, uh, in a book I wrote called The Liberty Handbook, I cite some statistics. Um, over 700 people have been released from prison for murders they did not convict. They did not, con they, did not um, they were convicted for the wrong, for murder they did not commit. Over 140 of them were released from death row. We are executing innocent people. For a nation conceived in liberty, this should cause all of us to go and hang our head in the corner in shame. And it's it's something, it's an issue that I think should be on everybody's radar. I don't want to be convicted of something I didn't do. You don't either. No listener of ours wants to. But it's something that not many Americans think about, honestly. And I think it's tragic. Yeah, I think so. I mean, just to cut in real quick, I remember like a story at the end of World War II where General Patton, when he um, was in Germany towards the end of the war, he kind of forced, I guess, the German populace to tour the uh, concentration camps to see what they, they had done. And, and I kind of think that, you know, all these people that are innocent, that were on death row and, and, and other similar things, you know, people should be forced to look at that stuff. I mean, you know, but but anyways, what what's uh, your third, I mean, fourth issue? I'm sorry. The, the fourth thing I want for our country is an empowered American electorate. I want American voters that are participating and demanding and hold our leaders accountable. And we don't have that right now. Um, in 2000, the 2014 midterms illustrate that perfectly. I was the Libertarian nominee for the United States Senate in 2014. Um, I got 52,000 votes, a little more than that, um, 900,000 behind the winner, but still more than any other third-party candidate ever got in a U.S. Senate election in Colorado. And that's not the sign of a empowered American electorate. 
Congress in 2014 had an 11% approval rating. We elected 96% of incumbents. America said, we're not happy with our government. We're unwilling to make a change. And until Americans start demanding better and start participating, um, we're not going to have better. Because if the Republicans or the Democrats were going to change something and give us decent government, they would have done so already. Anybody who has ever hired an employee knows the best indicator of future performance is past performance. So um, until America really takes an interest in their government and starts looking at others besides Republicans and Democrats, libertarians like me are going to be fighting an uphill battle. But we will continue to fight it. Yeah, I, you know, Galen, I think that um, you know the safest way to do that would be through the Congress, since um, there's 435 members. I mean, presidential politics is so divisive and partisan. I mean, you got Clinton, you got Trump, and they hate each other, and people who support one or another don't like each other. But when you're looking at Congress, you know, if I took a risk for two years on a libertarian or independence or you know whatever. You know, that's not such a big risk, and actually I have everything to gain and pretty much nothing to lose. That is uh, an excellent way to look at it. I have thought about that, too. I have hesitated to say that, though, because um, it just as, – as a candidate, I, want, I, 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 I must make myself familiar, and I must seem like a regular guy. And I think when I start saying that, people just, you know, just tune me out as this mother sure. But sure, you do, that's an excellent point, though. It's only two years, you know? What the heck? <laughs> and, 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 and you are, uh, so let's go through some um, issues, and we will touch up on these um, business regulations and taxes. Um, so what, you know, the, here's a very common one, something politicians always promise, but, but if you could... Um, maybe expand a little bit uh, and I'll just go down this list here uh, on accountability and transparency. What say you about accountability and transparency? Oh, I say that uh, <laughs> my pledge as a congressman is to, is to do Liberty's work every day. That's the only promise I make and Liberty has no secrets. Um, uh, as a congressman, I would be uh, completely open to whatever, um, whatever people think would be transparent and whatever they would want, I would be open to because um, you're in Washington, you're doing the people's business. Um, I do not meet with special interest groups. I'll be very honest, not really knocking my knocking down my door looking to meet with me right now, but I don't meet with them. Uh, my only special interest is liberty and liberty demands transparency and by definition accountability. Yeah, and I think most libertarians would probably, you know, be a safe bet as far as transparency and accountability goes. Uh, what, what about um, election reform? Do you think there is um, a any proposals that you might champion for election reform or, or things that you have found interesting that we might want to look at? No, I would not favor any sort of campaign reform. We have the government we have, which, let's be honest, is financed to a great extent by rich donors and special interests. We have that because we as an electorate are putting up with it. If American voters take an interest in their government and stop putting up with it, they'll stop electing people who are influenced by money. So um, I would not favor any sort of campaign reform, finance reform, because one, they always put loopholes in so they can get around it. And two, the problem will stop with an empowered American electorate holding their leaders accountable. Yeah, I mean, the ultimate accountability is going to be, you know, at the ballot box. And, and people, if it's really easy to look up who's running in your district, you know, as different choices and get their positions on these issues. And that's part of what we're trying to do here. And um, so the third issue I want to ask you about is small and mid-sized businesses. Um, you know, how important are they? I've seen graphs where over the last 25, 30 years, it's just downwards uh, as far as concerning new and small mid-sized businesses starting up. And, and please go back into the, um, you know, a 0% corporate 
tax rate argument that you wanted to bring up earlier? I would be happy to. Uh, the small business is the backbone of the American economy, uh, small and medium-sized businesses, and it is difficult to make a go of it for business owners because the government at every level regulates them to the point where it is burdensome. I think the government should only have the regulations in place that are required to establish and maintain a free market. Uh, the free market will determine which businesses succeed and which don't. Uh, uh, we, I forget who it was. Was it Herbert, Herbert Hoover that said the business of America is business? Someone in the 30s said it, and that's true. Well, actually, the business of America is liberty, but a free market makes all good things happen in this country, and the government must not stand in the way of small and medium-sized businesses trying to establish themselves and make a go of it. Um, regarding the 0% tax rate, I was campaigning, I was speaking between, before a group of libertarians in Boulder, Colorado, um, I was campaigning for a U.S. Senate nomination, which a race I backed out of for reasons that might interest you later. Um, and a business owner, and I said I support a flat tax of 10% on individuals and business. And a gentleman in the audience said, you know, we just passed that tax on to the consumers. You, and so really it's just an extended tax on citizens. And I thought about it for a second, and he asked me why I support a tax on businesses, and I said, well, it's a modest price to pay for the opportunity to make a fortune in this country, which I think is a good point, but he brought up a good point too. They're just passing it on to you and me. So if, if a corporation were spared the tax burden, we'd be spared paying it for them. And it's an argument that has merit, and I'd be willing to consider. Yeah, and any um, you know shareholder in that business, when they are you know pay themselves a salary and stuff, are going to be taxed again as as, as well. Um, so that might be another point as well. That's a very good point. I mean, it is going to end up going back to the consumer. That's for sure. And um, yeah. Now um, you did already uh, kind of talk about the military and uh, foreign policy. So, um, so let me ask you next about um, crony capitalism, government contracts. Do you think there is crony capitalism, a level playing field right now? And if not, what could make it more so maybe? Oh, that question has a very wide scope, um, a scope that's wider than my experience. I think history has shown that, yes, crony capitalism does exist. Um, People work for the government, and they get out of the government, and they use their government contacts to benefit the business they are working for or the businesses they are lobbying. Uh, I do not have a specific solution to that problem except to say that it ultimately boils down to the same thing that campaign finance reform boils down to an informed American electorate holding our leaders responsible. Everybody in Congress, if everybody in the United States Senate knew that every election cycle they would have to face demanding and participating citizens, what kind of government do you think we'd have? We have a great government. We have a government that works for us instead of the partisan, fractured, bickering mess we have now. Yeah, I hear you. I think, I, you know, ultimately what you're saying is absolutely correct. I mean, um, eventually I hope, I mean, I've seen polls where, you know, the American people would throw them all out, but that isn't happening yet. So hopefully, you know, you'll be in position, you know, maybe if, uh, you know, you could just ride the wave of, you know, discontents and reform and change and, um, what about these trade deals, um, like the TPP that's being uh, being proposed, and some of these other trade deals? Uh, what's your approach to um, to 
those specific trade deals and and, tr- and trade with other nations? I will be honest. I do not have enough knowledge to talk specifically about the TPP or any other specific trade deal. Um, I take a big picture view of things, and I support free trade. Um, trade barriers only protect those who otherwise would not be able to compete. Um, so nobody supports free trade as much as I do. Um, it's one of the fundamentals of a free market. So trade treaties that are good for everybody, that promote free trade, I am for. But I'm not going to waste your time and try to talk about something that I don't know any specifics of. Sure, sure. And it might be difficult because, you know, there's so many pages in it. I don't know everything that's in it e- either. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know right. really anyone. Does. Yeah. What about um, now? Here's, uh, you know, you already talked about drug legalization, and I think Colorado is kind of leading the way in that anyways. Um, and uh, what about, um, let's see, gun control? Uh, looks like, you know, it's a constitutional rights, right? Yes. Um, I support our Second Amendment rights without qualification or restriction, even though I don't currently exercise them. Um, I think when you look at the Second Amendment, look at the entire Bill of Rights. You look at the time when they were written, right after the formation of our country, after the Revolution, and you take into account the English customs and laws that influence them, I think it guarantees Americans' right to bear arms. It also talks about um, the militia, of course, but I believe the Second Amendment um, guarantees our right to defend ourselves, to bear arms, and we should be able to do that without government interference. Um, uh, I, talk, I compare it to the First Amendment. If and I'm going to make, make this joke because I grew up Lutheran. I had 13 years of Lutheran schooling. If the government told Lutherans they could only worship every other Thursday, would they put up with it? Well, they might. Yeah. They're Lutheran, but, you know, no, nobody would put up with the government telling them when they can worship. Why would we allow them to infringe on our Second Amendment rights if we don't allow infringement on our First Amendment rights? Right, right on. And um, now, what about um, healthcare? Uh, you did have a you know stance on healthcare on your website, which, by the way, is thefreedomtrain.com. dot com. So, if you want to thank you uh, learn learn more about a Gallon Kent, Libertarian for Congress, uh, Colorado's third district. That's who we're talking with. Um, and uh, his website is thefreedomtrain dot com. And so, yeah, thank you for the uh, plug. Absolutely. Uh, can you talk to us about um, health care a little bit? Yes, health care uh, is one of the most regulated segments of the American economy, and it's the biggest, one of the biggest fiascos. Um, gov- doctors and health insurers must have the same access to the free market that everybody else has. Right now, they don't have it. Uh, when we do that, when we get rid of the regulations that are hindering doctors, hospitals, and health insurers, um, less regulation means more innovation. It will mean lower costs. Um, Even now, if you paid for uh, a doctor's visit or some blood work, I did this one several years ago. I paid cash for some blood work, and it was about, I don't want to say pennies on the dollar, but it costs significantly less than it would have had it been built through an insurer. Um, Ron Paul said it best. We allow the free market to provide clothing, food, and housing. Why do we not allow it to provide health care? He makes a very good point. Yeah, and Ron Paul, a previous uh, U.S. Congress person um, who actually also was a doctor. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I most, yeah, you can get blood work. There's some elements of the free market, you know, in our healthcare system, if you want to call it that. But most places, when you go to, you never see a price. You never see, like, a menu, no. per se. Um, it's no. far from. And, and 
nurse practitioners, you know, can't really do their own things. There's lots of um, uh, ways that the free market could uh, open up as far as that goes. Um, so uh, let's see, there was, let me bring the list back up here. What about um, who's some of your favorite bull past or present um, elected or not? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring up a name that is uh, Abraham Lincoln. He is not very popular amongst some libertarians. Uh, right. Some people, some libertarians regard him as nothing more than a despot who ignored the Constitution at will, which he did. Uh, some will say he freed the slaves. Um, <laughs> typically, I take a middle ground, and I, I will say that Mr. Lincoln um, was determined to save the Union, for better or worse, and he did that. I would say that it had we not fought the Civil War, that eventually the North and South would have uh, reunited simply because they needed each other. But uh, Abraham Lincoln is one of my favorite historical characters. Not historical, favorite persons from history. He was com mostly self-educated. I am too. I am self-educated beyond high school. And I think Mr. Lincoln had a lot of good traits. Uh, uh, I want to say Thomas Jefferson too. But I'll tell you what, Jefferson has fallen out of favor the past couple, three years. I read a book, and I forget who wrote it, but it was called Master of the Mountain. And it was a biography of Jefferson solely as a slave owner. And Jefferson is rightly revered for writing the Declaration of Independence, one of mankind's most significant documents. Um, but he never did anything to free slaves on his plantation or when he was president. And you can't really argue with that. So, yeah, but let's talk about, yeah. Yeah. And I urge everybody to read that book. It's called Master of the Mountain. I forget who wrote it. It'll be easy to find. Um, completely changed my view on Jefferson. People I admire, my father, he always told me I could do whatever I wanted in this life. And when I was a kid, I went to John Wooden's basketball camp twice. And at basketball camp, I learned lessons about patience and perseverance that extend far beyond the basketball court and that I still put in use today. And there were founding, um, you know, big fathers and well, men and women that, you know, were against slavery. I think like John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, I'm sure there were many more. But um, mm -hmm. so, so um, and yeah, and even Benjamin Franklin was part of the abolitionist movement after a certain period in his life. Uh, yes. So what about um, different uh, events coming up? Have you been in debates yet? Are you going to be in some of the debates? No, I am not debates? invited. A private club in Grand Junction, Colorado, called Club 20, had a debate a couple of weeks ago I was not invited to. Uh, the Pueblo Chieftain newspaper is sponsoring a candidate's forum on October 20th. I am not invited to that. I have requested inclusion in there. not heard back. Um, uh, I am unsure if there are any other forums scheduled in the district. This district is very big. If it were a state, it is the largest congressional district in the country. That's not, that's not Wyoming or South Dakota or Alaska. Um, if it were a state, it would be the 23rd biggest state in the union. And it's hard to keep tabs on everything. But uh, no, I've been, I was excluded from the first debate. I am not invited to the second and um, I am trying like the Dickens to get in because uh, um, it's democracy's loss, only having two of the three candidates. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if they're not inviting you, I would say that they're not inviting the American people because, after all, having your name on the ballot – I am going to steal that line. Hold on. I'm going to steal that line. If they're not inviting me, they're not inviting the American people. That is brilliant. Go on. 
because taxpayer dollars go to having your name on the ballot and and having you, you you know the whole process and you're part of that process this year since you're participating so literally yeah they're not inviting the american people um and uh now i agree that you know um uh, people it's ultimate the responsibility of people and if someone else does it for them then you, you know it's a losing game it's a vicious circle downwards but as far as i do think that you know there should be open debates i don't think a private institution should be forced to do that but there should be some kind of forum where at least there's a couple debates that invites everyone you know maybe score voting might be something to look at in the future but um uh, what about what are some of um, your uh, upcoming events that you're going to have anyways? And uh, and what are some of the issues that we might not have talked about in this conversation that you'd like to leave with our audience today, sir? I, uh, as far as upcoming events, the uh, most I can do really right now is uh, Facebook Live. I've done a couple of those. Uh, they have not been well attended, but... Um, uh, please check my website, thefreedomtrain.com, for upcoming Facebook Live chats, which are opportunities to talk to me directly. Uh, as far as issues, we talked about the four ones that I really care about. Uh, if we do those four things, if we have an America at peace, if we have an economy anchored in low taxes and free markets, if we're not convicting the innocent, and if we have an empowered American electorate, that goes a long way to solving our problems. That goes, a, that goes a long way to having a country that we can be proud of. I will say this. I think it's a shame that we have not put man on Mars yet. I think if we wanted to, we could have done it in the 1980s. In my book, The Liberty Handbook, I have a chapter called Making America Great Again. That's how we do it. We send a man to Mars. Um, yeah, actually, I think I Apollo, think... oh, Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I think Apollo will love it. Um, was our species' finest hour. Nothing we have done, nothing we did before, and nothing we have done since has equaled that. And putting a man on Mars, I think, is the next logical step. Um, there is no enthusiasm for it, though, except for you know a few ex-astronauts like Buzz Aldrin who was on Apollo 11 and some people like me who think it's a shame we haven't been there. Yeah, and the offshoots of that would be advances in technology and, and, and things yes. like that. Yeah, and if, you know, we could, you know, probably trade some of the military spending that we're doing now and, you know, reinvest it into science, um, you know, that might be something that would be a better compromise. And uh, so I I, I I would agree with you on, on that one, actually. I think people have a yearning to explore, and, um, you know, just like the new world that Spain kind of funded to discover yeah. the new world, we just um, need to do that. It's in our DNA almost, and uh, I think that would create a lot of enthusiasm. We'd be able to kind of see how small and petty some of the problems are here, the more that we, you know, explore up there and uh, it might help us mentally as well a little bit. I agree with everything you say. It would be good for morale. Uh, the advancements we make in having to get to Mars would benefit everyone. Um, but we lost interest in the 1970s, and now we can't even put anybody in space anymore. We have to tag along with the Russians. Yeah, I know. It's, it, that's, that's tragic because we're spending all our money on other things, uh, unfortunately. And uh, so, you know, things that are supposedly a priority, like the war on terror and things like that. Well, well, okay. Galen, um, good to talk to you today. Definitely good luck in your campaign. It's interesting. I did uh, also interview um, in the second district there, Richard Longstreth, and you know, yes. maybe there could be a opportunity for, you know, libertarians, maybe even some Green Party candidates, some independents, and, you know, all of you to have, like, some kind of events just to, you know, say, hey, you know, there are other alternates on this uh, ballot here in Colorado, and, and, and just it would be a multi-member event that would, you know, hopefully uh, 
exponentially, you know, give you all some coverage and, and things like that. But, um, uh, well, we appreciate you taking the time, you know, on your busy schedule to talk with us, to enlighten our audience and, and let people know, I mean, you know, that they do have to be accountable, that there are options out there. And so it's a pleasure. And we do thank you for putting yourself out there for us to be able to interview you um, as a contender here. And so good to talk to you today, Galen. Thank you very much for joining us on the election channel and libertarianprogressive.com. You're welcome. The pleasure was mine. All right, everyone, check them out at uh, thefreedomtrain.com. That was Galen Kent, Libertarian for Congress from Colorado's 3rd District. And this has been uh, another episode here at blogtalkradio.com slash election channel, libertarianprogressive.com.